Welcome. Thank you for joining us. We're here to talk about whether or not games can equal profit and impact. And with me, I have my friends and colleagues, Susanna Pollock and Abby Spate. And we're going to talk to them in just a minute. But first, I'm, um, I want to provide a little bit of an overview. Um, for those of you who were really excited to see Eric Huey of both ESA and a band, <laughs> which is performing somewhere out there, um, he couldn't join the panel, so we're, we're sorry about that misdirection. Um, but we hopefully can cover your questions anyway. Um, so I want to start just by talking a little bit about why we think this is an important question and why now is the time to really focus on it. Um, I work at the Joan Gans Cooney Center at Sesame Workshop. And the Joan Gans Cooney Center was established about eight years ago with the intent of trying to answer the 21st century equivalent of the question that Mrs. Cooney posed in the late 1960s, which led to her creating Sesame Street. She saw kids watching beer commercials and repeating what they heard. And she said, if they can repeat beer commercials, they can repeat other things that they hear on TV. And maybe those other things would be meaningful in some way. Um, and actually, at the time, it was a real social movement um, for her because she was involved in the war on poverty. She was a documentary film producer at WNET in New York. And she saw it as a grand experiment of can television actually help not only to teach kids, but to try to bridge the divide that she saw happening among poor kids and not so poor kids, particularly in New York City. Um, and so she went out and raised the money to create what she saw as a, as a research effort um, that led to Sesame Street, led to the creation of what is now called Sesame Workshop. Um, so I was able to talk to her just a couple of years ago when we first launched an effort at the Joan Gans Cooney Center called Games and Learning, um, and ask her how she thought about games um, in the context of this trajectory that she witnessed for, for you know, the past several decades. Um, and what she says, well, I'll let her speak for herself because she's lovely and is much more interesting than I am. <laughs> so here she is. This is Joan Gans Cooney who created Sesame Street and Sesame Workshop in the late 1960s. <clears throat> Um, so I feel very privileged that I get to work in a space uh, near her, with her sometimes. Um, she's 85 years old and um, she's still deeply committed to this idea. Um, and for me, it's exciting to hear her talk about new technology and how it may help kids learn, but it's also interesting to hear her talk about, I think, research and development as part of a process that leads to both engagement and meaningful impact, right? And that's, I think, what, what we all want to talk about today. Um, I should just clarify for those of you who may not um, be in this conversation 24-7 like some of us are, um, when we say impact, we mean impact both on an individual child and potentially on the world, right? And so as Susanna and Abby speak, they'll be speaking about both of those kinds of results. Um, Mrs. Cooney is in, particularly talking, in particular talking about an impact on a child, and that could be cognitively, in terms of skills, it could be social-emotionally, um, it could be creatively, um, it could be physically, right? We've seen um, evidence of games actually improving outcomes in kids who are cancer patients, for example, and so we would consider that impact. Um, so, so why else do we think that this is, so we, so we do think that there's, we're poised to have this transformation occur in terms of how games and other forms of digital media could affect um, kids and youth. Um, the other thing that's happened just in the past couple of years is interest has grown and expectations for games have really begun to shift. And, and why do we say that? We have software companies like Microsoft who are spending $2.5 billion on Minecraft. Um, I think the White House just recently had its third education game jam. Um, we have prominent journalists like Greg Toppo from USA Today who just in the past year released his book which is called The Game Believes in You. Um, Susanna can speak uh, more directly to Games for Change and the Games for Learning Summit, um, which brought together Department of Education and ESA. Um, we also see, in parallel to that, we see generational shifts that are making a difference in this conversation, right? So the easy way of describing that is that I grew up playing Carmen San Diego. It's the most natural thing in the world to me, um, and I'm older than a lot of people that I work with. Um, but I don't think twice about thinking of a game as a positive experience, right? And so increasingly, as a generation that grew up with that kind of experience, takes leadership roles and, you know, they're working in Washington, D.C., they're becoming school superintendents, um, they're running investment firms, all these kinds of things, 
that generational shift is also having a, an effect on how we think about games. Um, then there's the money, which no one in this room, I'm sure, is concerned about in any way. <laughs> um, but we know that spending on games and investment in ed tech in general on the rise. Um, actually, Europe and Asia are on par to outpace North America in the next couple of years. Um, the work that I do, we look at this chart on the left-hand side where we see the global sales for games in 2014 was you know, nearly $82 billion. And learning games so far as just one part of Games for Impact is this tiny, tiny sliver of that, right? Um, but when you compare that against the rise of ed tech, and the chart on the right, if you don't know of EdSurge, you should, because EdSurge does some really great work around this. Um, it shows that while the number of deals is beginning to decrease, the amount of money that's invested in those deals is increasing. Um, there's increasing interest and increasing, increasing traction in ed tech dollars. So as we see that market in K-12 schools, which does trickle into other spaces like after school and at home, is growing, the global games market is huge, but currently the sliver of that market that really has to do with games that are designed to teach kids or educate in some way um, is, is pretty small. That to us is a, is a big opportunity. And then um, in terms of where I said at the Cooney Center, which is, which is part of Sesame Workshop, um, we know that there is a growing body of research that shows that playing great games can improve a child's life, right? And there's too many research studies to, <laughs> to even cite at this moment. But, um, it's a growing body of research. The benefits that I would point to most immediately would be there are high levels of built-in engagement. They are able to be personalized and customized. There's built-in assessment, which is a buzzword at the moment. Um, they can be played alone, they can be played together, and they can also bridge formal and informal learning environments, right? So we're now, especially with the rise of mobile gaming, we know that you could play a game at school, you could play a game at home, you could even go to your you know, YMCA and play it there. Um, and that type of effect is, is something really interesting for us to study. Um, we also know from our research that parents and teachers are playing a big role in this transformation. Um, this is actually a, a survey from Entertainment Software Association from last year where they asked parents, the parents who cited playing games with their kids, they asked, why do you play games with your kids? Um, I think it's funny that one of them, <laughs> one of the biggest answers is just because they're asked to, because that's what parents do, uh, <laughs> because my kid told me to. Um, but they also say that it's a good opportunity to socialize with their child, and they also say that they enjoy playing the games as much as their child does. Um, and so that also represents a pretty significant shift. Um, the Cooney Center did a survey, it's now been two years, I guess, on how surveys, or how, sorry, how teachers use digital games in the classroom. Um, and again, this number in from when we ran the survey just two years prior. So 23% use games in the classroom two to four days per week and 23% say about once per week. The number for every day is still only about 9%, but still 55% of those students um, in the classrooms of the teachers surveyed play games at least weekly, and that number is climbing. Um, sorry. Um, so with that, so that hopefully provides you a little bit of context. Um, I think what we may come back around to is what we had hoped Eric, the perspective that Eric would be able to share, which is the, the shift in distribution model. Um, and so just to give you a little taste of that, and if there's interest for that, we can dive into it a little bit more. But we all know that um, the other shift that's occurring is the shift from games that are distributed as boxes on shelves to games that are mobile and social and very different distribution challenges and opportunities than we had even 10 years ago. But, um, but with that, I'm going to transition to Susanna, who's going to talk to you about her work at Games for Change. And I, I, I will talk about distribution models um, uh, as well, because I do think that's it's an important um, uh, thing to mention as, as we talk about commercial games and games being distributed, that the um, development of platforms like Steam or even PS, you know, uh, uh, even PlayStation Live or Xbox Live will, does allow the independent developer to uh, to release games independently without the big partners, and I think that has created opportunities too. But first, to talk a little bit, a little bit about myself. Um, so I'm Susanna Pollock. I'm uh, president of Games for Change, and for those of you who aren't familiar with us, we are a 12-year-old not-for-profit 
And our mission is to uh, harness the power of games that, that they can have beyond entertainment. Um, and as, as Michelle said, it's, it's the, the use of games in social impact space, humanitarian needs, and education. Uh, we, we house a, a festival ourselves called the Games to Change Festival every year in June. If you're interested, you're in New York City in June, come check us out. Um, where we celebrate the best games uh, that are happening in this space. Um, and what's interesting about the Games to Change sector is it's not only a, um, a community of game developers who are choosing to make games uh, for, these, for these purposes, but it's also um, other kind of stakeholders and uh, not-for-profit, NGOs, government agencies, uh, brands, uh, foundations who all recognize the power that games can have to reach audiences and to, um, uh, to impart information and change behavior. Um, and so we bring all these uh, stakeholders together um, to have a conversation and celebrate uh, the power that games can have. But today I'm here to talk about um, the question of can games equal um, impact, right? And, and profit. And profit. Don't forget about the profit. Yes, and the profit. <laughs> so it, in the research that I've, that I've taken, and this is informal research, not, not in any kind of structured way, you know, there aren't that many examples out there in the commercial uh, sector that talks about games that have been developed from an impact perspective from the beginning. What I can talk about is some of some uh, either hap uh, happy accidents that have happened and some trends that are leading some of the AAA uh, developers and, and platforms and publishers into that space. And I have two examples up here um, which I want to talk about, both, both of which have been made by Ubisoft. Um, Assassin's Creed, um, uh, I'm sure many of you have played. Anyone play Assassin's Creed? Played it? Okay, I see somebody here who looks at the under the age of 18. But as, um, as, as that young man may uh, attest to, as I can with my kids, that there's a whole you know, generation of fans who are growing up learning about history through playing games like Assassin's Creed. You know, the, the game has been developed up in, uh, in Montreal with such integrity and with, with historians adv advising that not only are, are kids and young people and, you know, playing the game and learning, but teachers are noticing. And uh, through events that we've held at the Games for Learning Summit that Michelle mentioned, we've actually brought teachers together with the developers of that game together and talk about how mods can be created for use in the classroom. And uh, although there hasn't been an official mod that's been done by Ubisoft, I can tell you that teachers are going in and trying to create versions of the game that can be used, you know, that imparts the actual facts they're having within history and perhaps, you know, leaving out some of the more, the more controversial elements of a game that, that would be accepted in a, in a classroom. Uh, uh, similarly, with Just Dance, you know, again, a very populous game, obviously enjoyed by many families. It's a hugely successful for Ubisoft. Um, and they notice an opportunity, uh, initially through the marketing department, you know, of, of uh, creating and positioning Just Dance as part of this physical, you know, uh, education program of anti-obesity and getting kids out there and, and being active. And through a partnership with uh, Michelle Obama, they, were part they partnered on the Let's Move campaign. And today, you've got thousands of kindergarten classes running just dance exercises, because it's getting kids up and moving. Um, and again, is that, was that the intention of the game initially? No, I, I doubt it was. But it is a game that not only brings families together, it gets kids moving, and can be used for a, for a purpose that will benefit and have the kind of widespread impact as well as individual impact that, uh, that we're talking about. The next um, uh, approach is uh, impact through partnership. So I, um, I don't know if you noticed, a few months ago, there was an announcement that EA made about Madden um, in partnership with, with um, the NFL created a version of, of the game that focused in on statistics. Again, you've got um, you know, millions of fans playing Madden and, and as a inadvertently you know, dealing with, with numbers and statistics about having to make choices. Now, this isn't a fantasy football league. This is, this is about understanding the mechanics of, of the game and understanding why certain um, uh, strategies may work um, and is layering in this mathematical curriculum. And so uh, the three partners worked, or I guess two partners, EA and NFL, worked with Discovery Education to create a version of this game that can be distributed through schools. So, and so from, from different example, let's say from Assassin's Creed or even and Just Dance, who that predominantly has a direct-to-consumer model. In this one, they are they will 
they will market directly to schools. Um, albeit I don't, I don't believe this one has a monetary value assigned to it, so it's more for promotional purposes, but there is a chain of distribution that can happen through Discovery Education's established channels into the schools. Um, the next example I wanted to talk about is impact through acquisition. Uh, so Michelle mentioned earlier that uh, Microsoft acquired Minecraft um, two years ago for 1.8, uh, no, 2.5 billion. Um, dollars, uh, what you might not have heard is just a few months ago they acquired a small version of the game that was created by a company called Teacher Gaming that was Microsoft EDU. And by acquiring that product, uh, uh, Minecraft, sorry, Minecraft EDU, by, by acquiring that product, um, they've been able to put into a strategy in place to distribute a version of Minecraft into the schools with a curriculum attached. Um, now, it's a little early to say whether or not this financial model is, is uh, poised for success. They do have a pretty hefty price tag against it of $5 per student as a license fee. But with access to that, um, to that game, uh, those students will be able to play this version in school, at home, on their phones. So there is a, um, uh, there's access to the game that can live outside of, uh, outside of the, the schools as well. So I wanted to, to raise um, a couple of examples about games that were not published through um, a traditional a AAA game developer, because I do think they're um, relevant. I think that uh, the, the means of distribution now um, that, that are available to independent developers, as I said, through Steam or through Apple, through iOS, Android, does allow a revenue model uh, to exist that perhaps didn't exist 10 years ago. Um, and here are some examples. Now, you know, albeit they're smaller in scale, you know, we're not talking about 1.3 or $8 billion of revenue that my, Minecraft has, but for an individual developer or a small team, as you can see here, some examples, you know, this is, this is, a, this is more than a good living, you know? These are, these are modest successes. Um, so if you haven't uh, played any of these games, they're really, fu they're really fun. Most of them are on a social impact kind of level as opposed to educational games. Um, this War of Mine is, um, is it takes place, um, uh, it allows the player to take the, take the role of a, um, of a, a, ref, a refugee and people who live in a community where they have, um, have uh, a political um, uh, arm, uh, army coming, kind of taking over and having to live that experience. Papers, Please is about immigration. Take, you, you step into the role of a, an immigration and passport agency, a passport uh, portal having to make decisions on who passes through. And Gone Home is more of a, a personal story, an exploration of self-discovery set in the context of kind of like a horror um, whodunit story. Um, so all three, um, as I said, were made by small teams. They broke through on Steam or, on the, or uh, through, um, I think, the Apple store. I think This War of Mine is available on Steam, right? And, um, and on, on the iOS store. Uh, but this, to me, is a good example of you don't need you don't need to have those commercial models of the AAA developers. And if anything, I think the future holds a lot brighter for these type of games getting pushed out and finding ways to have impact and have you know that double bottom line where you can have um, you know make a living and break through and and to have a success. Thank you, Susanna. We'll come back to you with questions. Um, Abby, do you want to talk a little bit about your perspective from Zynga? Sure. That's a, that's a great transition, actually, because we are kind of in the exact opposite um, position as these indie game developers. So I'd say what their struggles are um, are our strengths, and what their strengths are our struggles. So it's, it's kind of interesting to put those two next to each other. Um, but first, I'm Abby Spate. I'm the director of product for Zynga.org, which is the social impact arm at Zynga. Um, Zynga is a social game company that makes Words with Friends and Farmville and Zynga Poker, which is downstairs, um, those types of games. And Zynga's mission is to connect the world through games. So there was always a really natural fit and opportunity to bring social impact in, into those games. Um, and so my job is to work with Zynga teams, with Zynga employees, to figure out how we can use what we do well um, to drive social impact. So I'm going to talk a little bit about a few of the ways we do that um, and kind of where we see that going. The first is what we call social impact features. 
These are integrations in existing Zynga games that give players the opportunity to give back to a nonprofit, to raise awareness about an issue, um, basically to affect a social issue from within the game. Uh, what I love about this model is that it came about really naturally. Um, it wasn't a decision by our CEO one day to start bringing social impact into our games. Rather, uh, some, some product managers, some, some folks on studios looked at what our players really engaged with, looked at what they were excited about, and saw this opportunity to bring real causes into, uh, into the games that our players were already playing. So the first charitable feature was a, um, was a dog with a cape uh, in Yeovil. Um, did anybody play Yeovil? Those who played Assassin's Creed? No, not the same audience. Uh, so it was a dog with a cape that benefited the San Francisco SPCA. Um, and it was just kind of a scrappy grassroots feature that that studio put together, but it was a huge success. Uh, and it flagged to Zynga employees that this could be a really great model that our players love, that can um, really benefit nonprofits, and that works well for the studios. So that model has built out uh, throughout the years. Sweet Seeds for Haiti was a big breaking point for that model. Um, this was a campaign in Farmville that, uh, that we launched right after the earthquake in Haiti that ended up raising about $3.5 million for Haiti earthquake relief shortly thereafter. Uh, so it was really a proof point that if you bring together, if you make it really easy um, and compelling and bring together players who are already engaged in these games, who are already passionate, who are already connected, um, there's a real opportunity to turn that into social impact quickly. Uh, so this is an example, this is a more recent example from Farmville Two Country Escape, um, where we had an entire event in the game that was all around, again, the ASPCA, um, raising awareness about adoption and raising funds for that organization as well. So uh, we, see, we see an opportunity to meet players where they are, where they're already going every day, where they're already feeling comfortable, where they're looking for interesting, engaging content, and using that as a really great platform to connect them to causes that are doing, or to organizations that are doing important work. So then next, um, so I mentioned the Sweet Seeds for Haiti campaign. Another important part of our in-game charitable features is disaster response. Um, so when there's a natural disaster, we definitely see a swelling of support from our players in-game, and we want to meet that, um, and we want to give them an opportunity to give back through, through the games that they're already playing. So this is an example from um, about a year ago when there was the earthquake in Nepal. Words with Friends ran a feature where they set a goal for players to play a certain, um, to score a certain number of points within a given week. And if they reached that goal, we would make a donation on their behalf um, to a responding organization, Direct Relief. Uh, so we have found that the, as we, as we continue to work with game, with game studios, um, our players actually come to expect these features if there's a natural disaster. Um, I remember talking to some players about how, how they felt about charitable features in their games, and, and they said, you know, when they open up their game and there's something going on in the world, they expect a way to connect to that from within the game. And so um, that, it's really important for us to kind of bridge the real world and the virtual world and give people an easy and effective way to give back through our games. So that's, that's an example of that. Um, if you go to the next slide, this was, so there's, there's also a category of that kind of bridging between the real world and the virtual world that's not about raising money, it's not about raising awareness, but it's about giving our players space to connect and process and, um, and, and share support when there's something tragic that happens in the world. And so this is after uh, the Sandy Hook shootings. Uh, we, we heard from a lot of our players, you know, we're used to seeing these disaster response features in your games. We want to do something. How can we help? How can we help? Um, we talked to local community organizations in the town. There wasn't a strong ask for funds. Um, so we, we decided what we were hearing from players was that they just wanted to connect. They wanted to reach out. They wanted to share their support. So through our games, we, we, um, we gave players a way to send a message of support, um, just kind of submit it to the community, uh, and then a team of Zynga employees volunteered to build this microsite that surfaced up um, all of the comments from our players around the world in these lanterns that were floating up um, into the sky. And so we sent that over to the local schools, to the local community partners. They made it available um, to the community there in Sandy Hook. So to me, this was just a beautiful way to, um, to create space for players to, to connect and to 
to offer support when, when that's what they really were looking for. So those are our in-game efforts. Um, there are another, another way that we think about social impact through games is through mentorship opportunities. So I'm gonna talk about two programs that uh, leverage Zynga employees as mentors. Uh, this is Colab. Colab is a learning games accelerator that Zynga.org um, runs, runs in partnership with some local organizations. We just kicked off our fifth cohort of companies. Um, so we've curr we currently have five ed tech companies that are coming into Zynga every day um, and getting access to great talks, to great mentoring from Zynga employees and, and to each other as these valuable resources. So the idea here is that um, when, when you're just getting started, uh, one of the most valuable resources you can get is, is just some advice and some experience from somebody who's been there. Um, so through Colab, we match Zynga employees with ed tech companies that are looking for specific types of, um, of expertise or feedback. So we go, we go through a one week boot camp where all of the Colab cohort companies hear from experts at Zynga on um, growth and distribution or on applied analytics or on um, UI, UX, and art. And they get kind of the high level overview of how does Zynga think about building a successful game. Um, and then they actually sit down with those fellows and talk about their struggles, their successes, where they think the opportunities are. So by the end of that week, we have um, a really strong profile of each company and an idea of how Zynga mentors can help them while they're there at Zynga. Um, and so then for about three or four months after that, each company works with Zynga mentors to try to address one of the challenges that they see in their game. Uh, so this is, a, this is kind of a way for Zynga to support the ed tech industry um, and try to help, you know, help these smaller early stage ed tech companies get over the hump um, address a challenge that they're facing, you know, just move more quickly uh, because we really believe in that space and we want to uh, support the entrepreneurs that are working in it. And then last but not least um, is what we call internally Studio G. Uh, G stands for good. Uh, and so it's a studio of volunteer Zynga employees who are working on games with um, partners externally. Our first game was actually with uh, Games for Change it was half the sky. It was a game around the half the sky movement um, around women's empowerment issues globally. I see a nodding head. That's awesome. Uh, right now, we're working with Adam Ghazali, who's a researcher at UCSF. Um, his focus is all around how games can have a measurable cognitive impact. Uh, so, how can games change your neural neurological structures? How can games actually make you better at? remembering what you're trying to remember, focusing on what you're trying to focus on. Um, and he runs them through rigorous research trials. So he is not, um, you know, his claims are real. He is measuring this. He is making sure that, uh, that these games are truly effective. Um, so he, he's a neuroscientist. He's a researcher. Um, he creates these kind of prototype games or hypotheses. Um, and then we work in partnership with him to try to make those as fun, as engaging, and as beautiful as possible. So it's a great, it's a great you know, division of responsibility or partnership in that he can really focus on what works from a neurological standpoint, hand it off to our volunteer employees um, to add some elements of progression that really make someone want to keep, back and, um, keep coming back and play or adds really beautiful UI to make it easy to use and fun to use. Um, so we've finished two games in partnership with him. We're working on the third now. Um, and, and his work is really interesting from a distribution perspective because his vision is that games can actually be prescribed in the place of medication. So imagine that you, um, imagine that you have ADHD and you've been taking medication to address that. His, his theory is that his games can address something like ADHD just as well as a medication would. Um, and he's seen some really great results around um, applied or directed attention, meaning the ability to pay attention to what you're trying to pay attention to. Um, so the first game that we worked on in partnership with him is going through those clinical trials. He has a game going through FDA approval right now. Um, so when, when thinking about how, what are, what are new and upcoming distribution channels for games, maybe? Prescriptions. <laughs> Adam Ghazali. That's, yes. 
G, <laughs> it's a spelling bee now, G-A-Z-Z-A-L-E-Y. UCSF. Yeah. Sorry? Adam, yes, Adam. Oh, I thought you said at. Adam Ghazali, yes. Sure. And there's actually all, a lot of the great information that Abby is sharing. Um, we have in a case study around Zynga.org that's available on gamesandlearning.org. So if you go to gamesandlearning.org, you'll also see the links that take you to Adam's work. Yeah. Um, yeah, the funny thing about the FDA approval is that that's how I felt when I heard that um, Remission 2, which mm -hmm. is a fairly well-known game, that's the one I was referring to, that actually has shown that kids who um, have cancer and they play this game, their outcomes are better. And the idea behind it is that it gives you this first-person perspective on traveling through the body and how does cancer work and what are the things that you need to do to battle it. But it's not just about practically, you know, eating right, sorry, eating right and exercising. It's also about um, empowerment, kind of understanding how your body works and really taking ownership over it. And it has been shown to have these great outcomes. Um, Cigna, the health insurance company, is now distributing it. Um, I didn't know that. Wow. Because they believe it will help their business. To distribute that game. Yeah, they, uh, the game does, what they, what they measured too was, was the um, commitment that these young ca cancer patients had to taking their medicine. So it was about self-administering uh, their, 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 their medicine, the pills, after they have yeah, treatment in the hospital, and that has increased. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. It's called Remission 2. There was a remission one. This is the sequel. <laughs> There's also kind of in that sphere um, our biofeedback games, and you can probably speak to this better than I can. Um, but the idea is that if you if if the game can surface to you um, an increased heart rate or increased stress reactions of some kind, you can actually learn to to decrease those, um, and that helps you. Uh, that that leads to a lot of positive outcomes in terms of your ability to succeed in stressful situations. Uh, and that, and Aaron Reynolds has a really yeah, great a game called Nevermind that that does just that. It actually encourages you to calm your health, your heart rate down. And the the more calm you are and lowering your pulse through the game, and it's basically a horror game. The better you do to advance <laughs> through the game. It's really fun. You I should check it out. Fail that game. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the, uh, Nevermind. The challenge, though, with that, I'm not quite sure about the clinical trials, is how, how do you measure, you know, whether they are truly measuring the success in the same way that, that Dr. Ghazali That's is right. in terms of um, some clinical research. Uh, but still, it's, you know, uh, they, they, don't, they don't profess to, yeah. to be anything than an entertainment game that might have some benefits in, in, in lowering your, your heart rate. I think we all have something to say about that. Um, so first of all, uh, games are a medium like everything else, right? So it's a tool. Um, and so from my perspective at the CUNY Center, we would say uh, they're neither good nor bad, right? It just depends on how they're used and um, who is supporting the use, right? So especially when it comes to very young children, it's important that the parents and the educators in their lives are a part of those decisions in terms of how they're being used. But they're neither good nor bad any more than television is, you know, neither good nor bad. Um, in terms of the research, um, there's actually a study we just posted on gamesandlearning.org just in the last week that there was a, a fairly new study that was actually showing that um, it was a trial of youth who were playing video games, and at the end of the trial, they were actually better at social interaction than they were before, um, which is not what some of the older research studies were showing. So I think just in terms of the social aspect of it, um, and to your point, kind of the effect of playing a lot of games, and that, that question about isolation, um, we've seen that those studies have evolved with some of these other, um, maybe it could be the quality of the games, it can also be the way that the games are used in what settings. Um, but the outcomes are actually better the, the, that, than they were before, right? We're actually seeing that there is no negative effect, and in some cases, it's a positive effect. Um, that said, there are games that are really great and games that aren't, right? Just like TV, I mean, <laughs> or movies or anything else, right? Um, and so I think part of what we're talking about, and I know that both of you have something to say about this subject too, um, part of what we're talking about is that um, there is a way to be deliberate and to be thoughtful about the way these things are built. 
um, that leads to the kinds of outcomes that we're talking about, right? Um, yeah, I, just to piggyback on that, one of the trends we're seeing with um, Colab, with the ed tech companies, are these um, physical and digital partnership games, so um, games that have both a digital component and a physical component. Uh, and what that, that really um, enables and, and builds upon real, real life interaction while, some, while a child is playing a game. So um, there's a lot of thought, especially in ed tech, being put towards how do you, how do you unlock collaboration, how do you unlock you know, real interaction, even if there's a digital component to the product. And I think there's some great examples of that. Um, just, just briefly, and it's my personal opinion. It's, I don't have any any research to back this, but you know, I think it's all about moderation, and that's what you know Michelle says. It's, it's you know, just as any form of, of entertainment, it's about how how you use it, how often you use it, and what you're what you're consuming. So, um, uh, I think that there are games that are are. Uh, that are best to be taken in that in, in moderation, and that there are are games as Michelle and and um, and Abby's talked about that are deliberately made for a social impact or some kind of positive um, outcome, mm -hmm. and that's and that is what we are we're focusing on. Right. Thanks for the question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, I think both of those apply. I was talking about the former. So um, so games that might have, like, uh, InPlay is one of the companies in uh, the latest cohort for Colab. And they have products that um, are, you know, a stuffed animal or, um, or a cauldron or, or some physical object that you have in front of you. But then your quest line, your, um, your sort of progressive element is, is brought to you through the digital experience on your tablet. And then those two things can be brought together through, um, through uh, augmented reality um, and through those types of technologies where you're, you're sort of experiencing the, the physical through the digital. Um, but it, it enables you to be playing in a real way with someone who's in the room with you and, and um, collaborating that way. Uh, we're working on an app that's sort of the, the ultimate social change app because it could make it a lot easier and faster to recruit not only a million people willing to do door to door work to get the constitutional amendment to our corrupt campaign finance system, these kind of you know, <coughs> laws that we need to do urgently, mm -hmm. but another million people willing to get arrested when to do direct action. Mm -hmm. Because you put those two strategies together, that's what's led to the most positive social changes in our history. Mm -hmm. um, and one worry I have is some of the Bernie Sanders people, I'm, I'm a Bernie volunteer, and that's why aren't you reducing rewards more? And so if you went to 50 households, you'd get a symbolic reward between 100, maybe somebody in the neighborhood would take you out for dinner, or a plumber would give you mm -hmm. an hour's worth of free plumbing, or mm -hmm. a psychotherapist would give you a free time, whatever. Mm -hmm. And if you went to 200, you get wine and dine by the whole neighborhood. And he said, well, they're, they're reluctant because um, you then kind of erase the intrinsic motivation, the intrinsic reward that keeps most of us, we're doing it to mm -hmm. save the planet, we're doing it because it's the right thing to do, because we know protesting and inequality is savage. Mm -hmm. um, and if you, if you start basing it on, on social rewards, uh, once those end, people stop being activists. But what are your thoughts about there any research you know? Well, I think what you're describing, you guys can jump in if you think I'm wrong, but um, I think what you're describing is actually the question of gamification. Um, so there, there is research around gamification. Um, and so what gamification does is it takes something that is not inherently a game, it's not built as a game, and then puts a level of rewards on top of it, right? Um, and there's actually quite a lot of commentary, at least, about gamification. Um, there are concerns about it, because to your point, um, when something is built as a game from the ground up, it has those intrinsic rewards, right? And it has that kind of um, depth of psychological connection and meaning that you don't get just by layering a reward on top. Um, that's what we would call the chocolate-covered broccoli syndrome, right? Um, I think, though, what you're asking is it's slightly different in that it makes me think, um, so I've worked in nonprofits for a very long time, and 
um, we studied, um, one of my older jobs, um, we studied the first Barack Obama campaign and what they did in terms of the online dashboard. So if you were a supporter of that campaign, you had this dashboard, right? And it actually tracked for you all the different ways that you participated in the campaign. And it included knocking on doors and making phone calls. Um, and there were not the kind of rewards you're describing, like a free massage or dinner <laughs> or whatever it was, um, but it was more like a leaderboard. Um, and it did a lot, it was symbolic, right? Um, and there are studies, there are actually, um, there's, a, there's a lot of work done on what worked and didn't work about his online campaign. And some of the people who worked on that spun off and created their own firm called Blue State Digital. This is someone off the topic, sorry, I just happened happen to know. Um, but they started a firm called Blue State Digital. Uh, oh, yeah? Oh, well, there you go. See, you could speak to this. Yeah, they want you to use the microphones. Um, so you could speak to it directly. But, um, but I think it's, it, what you're talking about is a little bit of a hybrid between the question of gamification and then the question of how you use some of these techniques in terms of online activism more in like a moveon.org kind of way. And so it might be kind of a hybrid of those two things. Do, do you think? They really want you to use the microphone. <laughs> yeah. Let's just, we'll take this. I think specifically about the Bernie Sanders campaign, they're already using the same playbook very effectively in terms of you know the maximizing digital engagement and and you know motivating the crowd through the same tool set that was used in the Obama campaign. Um, I don't know if they're specifically using the dashboard to motivate people, um, but all of the other tools are ones that they're using. Yeah, I mean, I think, so the question of gamification actually may, may be driven by some of this discussion as well, right? Because they see success, they see engagement. So the question is, if you layer these things on top, does it improve sales, downloads, right? And just um, from an anecdotal perspective, uh, we think about the the intrinsic versus extrinsic rewards a lot because there is um, th there's this existing intrinsic desire for that we see in our players to um, to give back to have a positive social impact and we don't want to um, replace that with just granting them a digital good and and um, we we do think about that a lot and I think a couple ways that we've uh, we've been able to weave that into a game and still make it feel authentic is through group goals. Um, so when we, when the whole uh, game community is working together to achieve a goal and when that goal is met, everybody receives some sort of reward, that ends up feeling like a, um, like a promise achieved or like an intrinsic motivation, uh, you know, uh, satisfied. And then the other example is when we give players a way to kind of rally their community or their friends to come into the game and help them support the cause. And so we see that um, there, there are ways to use the game as a platform for players to um, kind of advocate internally or to be a part of some, some success that has real meaning that ties back to the intrinsic desire in a more authentic way. I have two questions. First is, what is your biggest ROI? Is it creating new games or partnering with companies that have already made games? And then my second question is, are you working in the VR space at all? Because it's considered the empathy machine. So ROI and, v and VR, I think that's directed at yeah. you. Yeah, me? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so f our biggest opportunity is engaging our existing player base. That's, that's kind of the... Um, the value that we are lucky to have. So our, the biggest ROI that we see, for us it's not typically about creating new games, it's about creating experiences in our existing games that make it really easy and effective for players to, to give back through that game. Um, VR, we in partnership with Adam Ghazali um, and UCSF, we're working on a game for Oculus, um, which is really exciting. Um, it's all about uh, directed external attention, so your ability to pay attention to what you want to pay attention to and ignore what you want to ignore. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's a picture of someone with a uh, brain monitoring cap on. Um, but the idea in the game is that you are um, in a bathosphere, in a deep sea environment, and you're collecting bioluminescence from fish, um, and you get less and less information about when and where and how those fish are going to appear, and your goal is to be able to respond as well, as quickly, as accurately with less and less information. Um, so that by the end of the day, if I'm you know, looking at this room and something unexpected happens, um, I'm able to react well 
just as well as if you told me something unexpected is gonna happen right there in 10 seconds. Um, so that is the type of experience that is really conducive to VR. Not, for, I think you mentioned empathy, not, not for empathy, although I think that's really interesting, but more because of its uh, real life applications that have to do with being in real space. Susanna, you're also focused on VR in terms of the showcase for Games for Change, right? Yeah, so we're, we're looking at new technologies in general um, and new uh, immer immersive platforms that are offering new pathways for impact. Um, so we have actually have a, um, an event in April as part of the Tribeca Film Festival where we're highlighting this, these kind of um, hardware and software as well. So there are VR installations, um, there's biofeedback, the game Nevermind that I talked about is gonna be there. You get to have you know, your biofeedback and your heart rate monitor attached. We have wearables is another. Um, so I think just as, as we talked about, these are just additional tools that can be used for different types of impact. Um, some are social, some are individual, some are for learning, some are for empathy, um, but all of that is, is very exciting, um, I think. Thanks for your question. Thank you. Next question. Morning, everyone. Verdell Walker, Harvard Business School. Thank you for um, coming out to speak to us today. I had kind of a multi-part question about using games for education, and I just kind of want to take it back to the example of Assassin's Creed, um, which is not what you would think of something that is educational, but it actually does have a very large historical component to the game. Mm -hmm. So I was really wondering if you um, had any best practices for how developers can engage educational professionals within the game development process and also designing games that can ultimately be used not just for pleasure but also for teaching um, students and then lastly just your thoughts around like kind of the best ways to monetize that thank you okay um, well thank you for that question yes and, very good question and uh, I'm sure others on this panel will, will have an opinion too um, well all these questions are exactly what we were addressing at something called the Games for Learning Summit that we started last year with the US Department of Education and the whole purpose of that uh, that event was to bring together educators, academics, game developers, ed tech you know, uh, developers together to talk about how this co collaboration can happen because it needs to happen early. It can't, you can't layer in a curriculum and a video game afterwards and you know, it's just not gonna have the kind of effective um, nature and you can also uh, be difficult to assess too. You know, we talked a little bit about assessment and how, how that's inherent in um, in the way the games are built, that teachers are, are, are able to, if it's set up properly, to see how students are progressing through a game. And you can see when there are uh, moments where, where students aren't able to master, right, uh, a subject area. You know, as a whole, they're whole they're, these games are, are structured around failing, and where failure is actually a good thing. You keep failing until you learn, and then you master and move on. For all these reasons, it's, it's an amazing opportunity for educators and game developers to partner. Um, so if you um, are interested, I, I do recommend attending more of these events. Games for Learning Summit is not the only event that brings together this community. There's uh, GLS, um, there's... Games Learning and Society yeah. in Madison, Wisconsin. Yes, there are a number, and if, you, and if you want to get in touch with me, I'll happy to give you a card. I'll give you a list of these time of events. Um, but the collaboration is really key. It's about marrying a content expert with the game developer expert and having and having these partnerships, you know, uh, gestate from the very beginning, um, and I think that with Assassin's Creed, um, they did that from the very beginning. They just didn't do it for the purpose of an educational product. In the end, they did it because they wanted to have a, a product that resonated, that was a accurate, that had integrity, and for all those reasons, um, and and the fact that it looks gorgeous and has great game mechanics. I mean, they just happened to nail a lot of the the, the right components to make a successful game. What they didn't build into it is any opportunity for assessment. They didn't do, you know, develop a distribution strategy to get into schools. Now, if they had done all of that, and that is what I would love to see some of these, the bigger developers do, and there's, you know, there's, it's possible that that can, you know, that they can achieve those goals. Um, in terms of how, what is the return, uh, in terms of how do you monetize, some of that has to be focused on, on what is your end consumer. Are you looking to sell this through schools? And, you know, there, you've got the, Book publishers who are now figuring out how to make digital products, mm -hmm. they're, they're looking at different content that can be pushed through to schools. Then there's also a direct-to-consumer model where you are speaking, you are trying to sell these products directly to parents or to the stu to students themselves. So I think, I think there are viable different models. You can have to decide uh, early on who, who you want to, to market towards and then, and then go with from there. 
Thank you for the question. Um, it seems like you mostly talked about companies that have either been making games that have a discovered educational aspect, uh, educational technology companies that are branching into educational games, and specifically research-oriented groups normally affiliated with uh, schools. And I was wondering if there was a space in monetized or not um, educational games for change for indie developers who don't necessarily have one of those backgrounds to go build specifically for Games for Change, and if so, what resources were available to them, and if not, should they just package an educational and interesting experience in a normal game? No, I mean, I, I think absolutely there <laughs> is space. Question. There is absolutely space for that. And those three examples that I put up, I don't know if you can find it, yeah, those sure. three developers absolutely were making Games for Change, and they're all independent, and none of them are educational. So uh, most of those were creator-driven, so they're driven by the artists, you know, the game developers having a story they want to tell. And because they're very creator driven, and these stories happen to be meaningful and personal and, and wanting to have this kind of impact. None of these were designed with, like, as I said earlier, with an assessment tool. Like, there's a question of, you know, how do you measure, how do you measure impact? None of, these, none of these game developers would say, oh, well, there's a model and we did this clinical study and blah, blah, blah. The impact is, you know, is just about how many people are playing it, and the fact that there's um, a positive message that is hopefully connecting. Um, I do think there's a place for this kind of studio, and I, and I can give other examples of studios that have, um, have grown out of uh, a lot of uh, uh, game uh, developer universities, um, a lot of students coming out of it, a lot of the artistic community, there's a whole movement called ex Expressive Games, which again is more about telling personal stories and explore gender and expose racial issues as opposed to, you know, bombings in, you know, in Iraq, you know. So there are, there are a lot of different, I think, uh, modalities of, of games. And to develop that community, well, join our community. We have a very active Google group. And, it's, and there are four active developers or would-be developers who are starting out and are looking to develop that kind of community. I will say, based on my personal experience, that community is very collegial and very supportive of each other. So I, would, I wouldn't pack it in. Whatever you said at the end there, should they just pack it in? Yeah, I wouldn't pack it in. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, thank you very yeah. much. Well, one yeah, more thing you. I'm going to say, just because, mm -hmm. thank you, Abby, for reminding yeah. me. Well, we, we put out um, uh, several times a year some challenges um, out to uh, the developer community to design games around a social issue. Um, these are calls to action for, for developers, possibly like yourself, who are look, looking for funding, looking for um, commissions. Um, and we typically do that on behalf of a, of a partner or a sponsor, a fiscal sponsor, and a, and a, um, uh, and a non for profit. So we actually have two active right, three active right now. They are overlapping. One is on financial literacy, one is about climate change, and the other one is on diversity. And all you have to do is go, go to gamesforchange.org, and um, if you look at the blog, they'll list out the criteria for each. And sometimes these challenges require that the participant has to have a functioning studio to actually make the game. And sometimes these challenges are just to surface some great ideas. So if you want to come up with a paper concept, and it's a kick-ass paper you know, concept around you know, climate change, that's enough to win, just depending on what the guidelines are. So great opportunities for exposure that way, too. I'll check that out. Thank you yeah, very much. Yeah. All right, I think we have time for one more. Go ahead. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Uh, thank you for coming out and doing the panel. Uh, my question, or yeah, question was sort of like with with Assassin's Creed, uh, it was always designed with the intention of being historically accurate, but it was never designed with the intention of teaching children about history or teaching anyone about history. Mm -hmm. And there's a game a dear friend of mine and I play, and we love it, we think it's so fun, is called Keep Talking and Nobody Explodes. It's a two-player game where one player is presented with an explosive device and one person is presented with a manual. And so the two players have to communicate by saying, okay, this thing has like four red wires here, which wire do I cut? And the person with the manual says- I played says, it, it's really fun. Yeah, it's really the fun. person like with the manual says, cut this wire yeah. or don't cut this wire. And so I was thinking, keep talking and nobody explodes could be used to teach people about communication skills, even though it was never designed for this. So how do you feel mm -hmm. about like with Assassin's Creed and Keep Talking, how do you feel about games that were never designed to be impactful or educational ending up 
doing those things? I think that's a happy accident. You know, I almost made my slide called Happy Accidents, um, but, but it's a byproduct, right? It wasn't intentional, but often that by the integrity of, uh, and the inspiration of the game developer, you end up with something that really affects people. Um, I mean, I'm all for it, and I think the more, and I think so are teachers. I think was, uh, as this generation, uh, we talk about the generational shift, mm -hmm. as teachers, are, are, that have grown up playing games are realizing that they need all the tools they can, they can use in the classroom and they don't care where they're getting it from. And if they come across a game like that and they think it's gonna help their, their students collab, you know, collaborate and communicate um, uh, in advance of their next, I don't know, you know their next joint history project or, or um, mock debate or you know, whatever it might be, that they'll use that in the classroom. So um, if I don't know if you play it or you know the developer, but I think it's the type of game that absolutely should be brought to the attention of, of academics at one of these many conferences that I've talked about because I think it'll be I think it'll be used. Well, it also goes. I mean, I think what's kind of interesting about that is this top-down versus bottom-up mm -hmm. type acceptance of these things because Minecraft, um, I think, is the the ultimate example of that bottom-up kind of adoption, where it wasn't something that came with a huge curriculum and a huge package that was sold to schools, and you had to convince teachers you should use Minecraft in the classroom. Um, kids were playing it at home, and there were a handful of teachers that found out about it, one named Joel Levin in particular, who started his own company. Um, he was a computer science teacher in Brooklyn, and he saw Minecraft and said, I think I could mod something out of this. I think I could do something with it with my kids in my computer science class. And he created a whole community around that. And that led to a company called Minecraft EDU, which was then purchased by Microsoft, and I saw Joel last week, and he's no longer a Brooklyn computer science teacher. Um, it's been a quite, quite a trajectory for Joel. Um, but that, it's it almost, um, it actually kind of illuminates a way around what most people see as a big barrier in this space, which is it's so hard to sell into schools, mm -hmm. it's so hard to convince superintendents, mm -hmm. but when you have something like these games that aren't packaged that way, it's sort of a back door, right? It's more of this, this grassroots kind of acceptance and, and adaptation of it, right? Which may end up being more successful than going the other way. Yeah, and I think two other enablers for that are just uh, the there's a um, there's a focus on 21st century skills, things like collaboration that that you wouldn't necessarily like that wouldn't necessarily have been deemed just purely educational in the past, but now there's a there's a growing acceptance of the of the educational value of those sorts of skills, and those are the skills that um, that are nurtured and fostered through a lot of non non intentionally educational games, and then um, a theme at Games for Change conference a lot of the time is that learning. Learning is actually fun, naturally, if you don't get it in its way. You, you know, you're progressing, you're achieving. These are all things that feel good. And so a lot of the things that, um, that we, we, we choose to do because they're fun have some inherently educational or learning value. And so if you kind of get out of its way or you um, create a way for teachers to use that tool quickly and easily and measure its effectiveness, um, it, it can happen naturally. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, real quick, besides that app that's going to be recruiting a million people to get arrested and a million people to do door-to-door, -door, the main thing we're working on is an app that helps couples have better relationships. Oh. <laughs> and I've had a very hard time, since we don't have a pile of money, to recruit people that are every, everybody from storyboarders to game designers and developers to gamify that or, or actually have a companion game. I own Coupleville, by the way, give you a little hint, um, to go along with the uh, the company's called Couple Wise, which is right now just very learning-oriented, teaching skills to couples that they need to succeed. Uh, do you, my question is, can you give me any smart ways to recruit um, game, game, game talent that willing to work for a little bit plus stock because it's so hard to find. Usually they're very young and don't care about marriage anyway, um, <laughs> but maybe old, older ga uh, game talent. So just to quickly yeah, to yeah, answer it, I think probably going to students and going to graduate level students are is is my suggestion. Um, I what think would be the best school for that? Yeah, well, so there's actually an alliance that ESA supports. So if you go to the Entertainment Software Association website, you'll find information about the Higher it's, Ed it, Video Game Alliance. Yeah, it's called HEVGA, H-E-V-G-A, Higher Educational Video, Video Game, Game Alliance. Right. You can just Google it and <laughs> yeah. you'll find it. And it's a network of 141, I think, schools um, and they must have some communication out, out to different schools. Yeah, there are there's, there's schools with um, game design or game development.
courses. Okay, what about uh, Zynga think, alumni? Any way of getting a hold of them? <laughs> you guys laid off a lot of people at once. So. <laughs> and, uh, I'll talk to you later about this. So, so thanks so much for, for coming. We really appreciate it. And we'll be here for a few minutes if you want to come up and talk to us. Thanks so much.